All right, and I'm going to share a screen. So uh, welcome to the June 8th, 2023 Snow King Water Watchers meeting. Um, our agenda for this evening is going to go over some introductions and announcements, uh, hear from some partner programs, talk about our plans for training and recertification for the remainder of this year. Uh, talk about some other events that you might want to participate in. Uh, go over some questions and answers about a new variable that we've added to our monitoring process, uh, conductivity. And also talk about our cards, which is a new way that we're doing bacteria. And then just whatever anybody wants to share. So uh, first of all, I'll just share one announcement, which is that uh, this picture was just taken a couple of days ago, um, or actually yesterday. Uh, we were uh, fortunate to be the recipient of a Green Globe Award from King County for environmental excellence. So it was really, uh, it was a neat um, recognition to get. And uh, there was a lot of great other types of programs around the county that got recognized. So it was really, that was kind of a cool thing. So I'm going to stop sharing right now and just kind of um, go around and just ask people who are representing some of our different partner programs to kind of share what's going on with you guys right now. So maybe I'll start uh, with Anna, who's on the East Coast also. Hi, Anna. So Anna, are you ready to share a couple of updates about what you're doing with Puget Sound Keeper and if you're doing any kind of youth stuff or monitoring stuff this summer and fall? Yeah. Um... So Puget Soundkeeper right now in our Lost Urban Creeks project um, are doing um, uh, basically quarterly monitoring of two creeks, Springbrook Creek and May Creek in Renton. Both of them are, uh, Springbrook is in Kent and Renton and, and May Creek is in Renton. And uh, we're taking um, one month off and uh, two months on basically to do quarterly monitoring of those two creeks. Um, the big activity that we're doing this summer is we're having kind of a water quality demonstration day at the Mill Creek Canyon Earthworks Park, very long name. It's a park at the base of the Mill Creek Canyon in Kent. Um, we are basically going to be demonstrating how we do our water quality monitoring our bacteria monitoring and um, benthic macroinvertebrate um, monitoring uh, for anyone who comes, but uh, specifically uh, youth, uh, summer youth cohort from the World Relief. I don't know if uh, folks are aware of this group that's in Kent. Uh, they work with refugee families. They have um, a church facility where they've built community gardens and rain gardens, and um, they have a summer cohort of youth that are going to be coming down to the park on the on Friday, um, July 21st um, for some water quality demonstrations. And we would be happy if anybody wanted to come and visit. I think Eric is going to join us and bring some of his uh, macroinvertebrate sampling equipment with him. Um, and it's just going to be uh, a few hours on the in the park, uh, just demonstrating how we do our work. And then we're gonna actually follow it up with a, a walk up the, the Mill Creek Trail, the Canyon Trail. So that's the big activity we have planned for this summer. All right. Thank you. You're welcome to stick around as long as you can until it's bedtime. Okay, how about um, Brian? What's going on with Stream Keepers this summer? Yeah, so I'm Brian Saunders, and uh, I sort of represent the Lake Forest Park group of Stream Keepers. And uh, we are doing monthly sampling still, and uh, we basically sample the two major creek basins in our 
in our area, the Mackler Creek Basin and the Lion Creek Basin. And we've added a whole bunch of bells and whistles to our sampling. We've got conductivity going now. We've got nitrogen and phosphorus using a color, uh, calorometer and uh, all the basic other stuff. And uh, we've got a contingency now of about 18 people. So we're, we're really stacking them up. Uh, and I've sent out word about uh, training. I haven't heard back yet, Eric, but I'll keep you in mind. And, and this may be a, a bad time for this question, but I do have uh, something I'd like to ask and then have everybody, maybe we can have a, a, a group session at the end to talk about it. But there has been two episodes that um, I've been called on um, from neighbors with things happening in their creeks, like in, in a tributary to Lion Creek, someone noticed a big milky white substance coming down the creek. And another one um, happened in Macular Creek where they had uh, some people growing salmon eggs, had them completely destroyed. And it turned out there was a, a washout event that uh, WashDOT was, was working on up creek. So just wondering how people would how deal with that and what, what their experience has been with that. But we can, again, as I said, we can maybe push that to the end. Sure. Well, actually, I would say, we, do we still have Anna? <laughs> Anna has probably got some uh, feedback on that. Um, you know, uh, Puget Soundkeeper has uh, kind of a guide to reporting um, incidents and spills and hazards. And also uh, Department of Ecology, you know, I would probably I would probably start with reporting to Department of Ecology and then also reporting to the jurisdiction. So if the jurisdiction is Lake Forest Park. I would report to both those about what's going on. Okay. Do we have a sort of a, maybe that, maybe that'd be, a, I can start doing some research on that, but maybe a, a nice little sheet we could pass around to everybody about how to, how to report those things. That would be kind of a nice little handy thing to have. Sure. Yeah, we have sent out a guide, um, but yeah, we could also condense it and make a, a good good synopsis of that. So yeah, good idea. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, how about, um, let's see, Jen, do you wanna tell us what's going on with Whale Scout? Well, so Lori made it, so you might want to get your report from Lori. <laughs> okay. I'll, hang out, I'll hang out for a minute and see if there's anything else to add. Yeah, but you prepared for it, so maybe you should. Oh, well, prepared, <laughs> I mean, yes, okay. Um, we'll chime in together. Okay. Okay. So uh, I guess the most recent thing is uh, working at uh, the former Wayne Golf Course um, in Bothell. Uh, we have a new site that we're clearing uh, of Blackberry in order to plant their um, in the fall and winter coming up. Um, we're also watering the plants that we installed. This is all on the west side. We, we installed plants um, this past planting season that we're watering and trying to keep them going because it's already so hot and dry. Um, uh, and then at Bear Creek, um, we're pretty much done with planting. So just maintenance, watering and weeding over there. Um, it's looking really nice. Lori sent us photos um, and sorry if you can hear my dog. Um, to help us with those, we have two um, spring interns and we're gonna have more interns. And I think those interns will also get some uh, water quality monitoring um, training, which I'm hoping to go to. So maybe I'll be here next time as a volunteer. And, um, and also we have naturalists stationed already at uh, the west side of San Juan Island. Um, there, there'll be more training for, but us, more training coming up for that. But some people are already out there um, because the whales have arrived. So um, I think that was everything. Lori, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that's basically everything. Um, the bear, I, the bear, are you going to do the interns at Bear Creek? Are you going to um, provide them with training, Eric, at Bear Creek, or are you going to do a different location? 
So just for those on the the call who don't know who uh, Whale Scout is, Whale Scout is a nonprofit organization that does things like habitat restoration to, uh, you know, with the ultimate goal of benefiting salmon and therefore benefiting orcas. And they're, they have interns and the interns have done water monitoring activities as well as um, restoration activities in a couple different locations. One's on Bear Creek and Redmond. And then they also are working on <clears throat> Wayneita Creek in Bothell at the <clears throat> former Wayne golf course. And so my understanding from Whitney is that the interns are going to do water monitoring on uh, Wayneita Creek. Uh, this year because they want to find out what's going on with the water quality of Wayneda Creek. Uh, and Wayneda Creek is a tributary that flows straight into the Sammamish River. Oh, cool. Oh, I might want to mention too that we found water coming into the Sammamish River also on the other side. Um, so we've been where we've been clearing the Blackberry is kind of the northwest corner. Um, and we haven't figured out where that water is actually going to coming out. I mean, it must be on, in a pipe coming under the road. So we're excited to see sort of what that is and if we can, maybe we'll start monitoring that as well. I don't know. Hmm. Okay, cool. All right, uh, how about- uh, Thanks, Gary? Jen. <laughs> yeah, thank you. How about uh, Gary, do you wanna tell what's going on with uh, Thornton Creek Alliance and your water monitoring and, uh, and also maybe give a little update on the, the DNA project? Well, <clears throat> the DNA I'll save till a little later, if that sounds okay to you, because <laughs> that's a little bit more involved than what I think we're talking about now. But um, uh, yeah, so I'm Gary Olson uh, uh, with Thornton Creek Alliance, um, our monitoring program. Again, we monitor roughly uh, 20 locations on the two forks of the creek and the tributaries every other week. Um, Kind of recent activity, uh, we're starting again to do, we're gonna start doing some conductivity um, on the creek. We've got a quarterly meeting scheduled for the 22nd um, where we'll do some training on that, but also uh, talk about our results for the previous quarter. Uh, the uh, We recently did a, an event at the John Rogers School uh, for their STEM night, um, kind of talking and doing demonstrations on um, monitoring and water quality. Uh, we're going to be involved with several summer festival events this summer. Uh, Maple Leaf um, Ice Cream Social has an event coming up in July. Victory Heights has an event in July, and then we're going to be at the Lake City Summer Festival in um, August, um, talking about our programs. Um, we also got a small grant uh, that we use to uh, purchase a, uh, a, a um, watershed table from uh, Enviroscape which is a kind of a demonstration of what happens uh, to the various non-point source uh, contaminants that can get into the water system. It's a great uh, activity if anybody has ever seen it, where kids just love it. And so we're looking forward. We've, we've borrowed it in the past from the EPA, but now we have our own. So we're excited about that. And we'll be using it at these various events that we go to. Um, so that's probably a good wrap up for right now. Okay, thanks, Gary. Does anybody else have any news that they want to share about uh, what's been going on with them or water monitoring? Kelly, do you want to talk about uh, um, Friends of Saltwater State Park? Well, Friends of Saltwater State Park, um, they've got a group of about, I don't know, there's about 80 volunteers that each section kind of does something different we have a group that does habitat restoration and does an ivy pole every saturday first saturday in in whatever month it is we have a group of us about eight or nine of us that really do more education kind of stuff and organize groups with uh, school kids and daycares and whatever and 
take all the kids on nature walks around the park and do some beach exploration and teaching about different things from ecology to life cycle to habitat restoration and why uh, the environment's important. There's Bob, Kathy, Jamie, and I that do water monitoring. We go out every other week and do um, all of the water chemistry and the bacteria sampling. Uh, I mean, it's just Friends of Saltwater State Park is always busy. We always have stuff going on. And it's, you know, it's a really fun, dynamic group. Rhoda Green, she's our kind of group leader. She also teaches diving. And so they have a group of divers that go out and monitor the artificial reef and check on the critters and all of the things that are going on and any impacts from like the strong tides that we've been having this week. So could you could you talk about what how you guys share your water monitoring data? Right. So when we do our water monitoring, after the results are in of like the bacteria and whatever, we have a spreadsheet that puts a graphic out and we post it in the park down by they have like a snack bar that has a kiosk and we post the results there and so any person that's visiting the park if they come up by the snack bar they have information on the results from the last four months worth of monitoring because it carries four months worth of data and it shows the trends and we do a little write-up about how the results have changed like if the bacteria counts going up and any odd results like if say the alkalinity is way different than what we've been seeing or if the dissolved oxygen has gone up or down we kind of analyze the results and print it all out and put it up there on the kiosk for anyone who comes to the park and then we also report the results to the state of Washington because the the state of Washington gives us some grant money to help pay for the chemicals that we use in the water monitoring. And we also forward a copy to the city of Des Moines that they use in their decisions on how they're going to manage some of the things that go on upstream from Saltwater State Park. And then you said, I think you said you also share it at meetings of the Friends of Saltwater State Park. Yep. Is that yep. All of the friends get the information. It goes out when we have the results, there's a group email that it goes out to everybody and the friends. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted you to just uh, mention that because I think that's a great example of how to share uh, water quality monitoring data. Anybody else have any other uh, news they want to share? Okay. All right. Um, well, I'm going to share my screen again and cover some other uh, items. So uh, we just went through partner updates. So now we're going to talk about our uh, 2023 training and recertification plans. So in terms of the different classes that we're planning on offering this year, uh, we have introduction to water monitoring, physical and chemical monitoring, bacteriological monitoring, stream biomonitoring, BIBI, which is benthic index of biotic integrity, and stream flow and habitat assessment. Um, the training model, so we have kind of a different a model for new monitors, and we have a model for existing monitors. So for new monitors, um, they sign up and register for the class with with me. Uh, we will provide them with the Global Water Watch Manual. Um, the classes right now, I'm just having people watch recorded classes that I've delivered previously um, so they can just watch it whenever they want to watch it. Um, then there's a little quiz on the content. Uh, they participate in a practical training session. Then they get their certificate. Uh, I set them up in our database. And then if they have a new site, we establish that in the database. And so this is kind of the model for most of the different types of classes that we offer. 
and feel free to interrupt if anybody has questions on anything as we go through. Uh, then for our uh, recertification for our existing monitors, this is something that has been on, um, sorry, I'm just gonna hide that. Uh, so this has been something that has been suspended during COVID. Uh, but we're, I'm going to try to have us bring this back um, just as a good general practice and it is consistent with Global Water Watch Quality Assurance Plan. So the process is essentially going to be after one year for new monitors um, or every two years for active monitors, uh, there's a little uh, content, basically quiz for each type of discipline of monitoring. Uh, and then there's a practical session. So either attend a training session again counts or have somebody attend your field monitoring who's an experienced monitor, ideally a trainer, and they can sign off the fact that you're um, doing the monitoring correctly and that you don't have any questions about it. So that's the process that we're gonna try and do this year for uh, recertification. In terms of the schedule for classes, uh, hopefully you can all see this. On uh, June 17th, we're gonna have a general physical, chemical, and bacteriological training. So that's gonna be for new monitors or recertification for existing monitors. Um, on June 22nd, we're gonna have another session of that for Whale Scout interns. And both of those are gonna be 10 to one. The one on the 22nd, it's gonna be at Wayneita Creek. And I think the one on the 17th is gonna be at North Creek. On July 9th, we're gonna do a stream biomonitoring training again at North Creek. And then July 11th, a, a BIBI training. July 27th, we'll do another round of physical chemical training with uh, Whale Scout interns. Uh, August 3rd is gonna be stream biomonitoring with Whale Scout interns. And then uh, August 5th will be stream flow and habitat. And all these, our training dates are on our website under the section of water watchers and then there's a drop down for upcoming water monitoring classes so the schedule is posted on the website uh, some other events that you might want to mark on your calendar if you'd like to participate uh, we're going to be doing water monitoring demonstrations and just also just representing Snoking Watershed Council on July 19th at the Kenmore Farmer's Market. We're gonna be going out and doing BIBI sample collection at a couple different locations. Um, part of our grant uh, funding and our grant uh, scope of work says that we will collect at least four different locations. Ideally, we want to do some tributaries or some locations that aren't already being done by King County. So we're generating some new data. So one of those BIBI collections will be on August 2nd. On August 3rd, we have a volunteer appreciation event. So you are all welcome. So anybody who's a volunteer with our program in any capacity or as a partner is welcome to come to our event in Kenmore. Uh, August 12th is another uh, opportunity to participate in some demonstrations. It's at an event called Sustainamania in Bothell. Uh, we'll have another BIBI sample collection on Friday, August 25th. And then on September 16th, we're going to have, uh, we're going to participate or help host a Streamfest event in conjunction with some other partner organizations. Um, this is something that we did. Last year, it turned out great. We had a lot of people there, a lot of fun, um, really got people engaged in learning about local creeks and watersheds. Okay, I'm just gonna talk briefly about conductivity monitoring. And again, if anybody has any questions, um, let me know. So this is a new variable that we added we had a little training session uh, at our, I think it was our last monitor meeting. So that's a picture of the meter that we're using right now. And we have those available for anybody who wants to add that into your monitoring repertoire. Um, 
basically the process, we have these instructions that go out with the meter. So this is just what you would get in conjunction with the meter, but essentially you're just gonna collect a sample of water in a beaker that you've rinsed a few times, a couple, two to three times. Um, you're gonna put, turn the conductivity meter on, put it in there up to a certain point. You don't wanna dunk it too deep, but you wanna have it in there, but not on the bottom. And you'll just kind of gently swirl it for 30 to 60 seconds. And the conductivity number is going to uh, change and eventually it will stabilize and give you a particular number. And then our recommendation is that you do that three times and average the result. And uh, at that point, you can just rinse it off with deionized water that we provide along with it, let it air dry, and then you're done. We also have a calibration procedure. You really shouldn't have to calibrate these unless you're getting some funky results or it's been a long time since it's been calibrated. So this is not something you're gonna to have to do every time, um, but this is something we might do periodically, like um, monthly or quarterly, depending on how frequently the meter is used. Anybody have any questions on electrical conductivity monitoring? Okay, so uh, next on the forms to record what what the result of the conductivity is. Uh, that would just be on your data sheet. It just goes under uh, other chemical tests. So like. Um, <clears throat> I'll give. Uh, so like here's a data sheet right here and I did some conductivity monitoring and there's a section right here on the sheet other chemical tests and that's just where I recorded I just wrote electrical conductivity 225 micro siemens so Eric what what does this um, reveal about the um, stream quality I have no idea, really. Uh, we, I can send out a document again. We had a training um, on this, but it's essentially, it reveals it can reveal a number of different things. You know, there's there's kind of a baseline level of conductivity depending on the water body, and so it can reveal, um, you know, the presence of. Uh, pollutants in the water. So if you see like a change in the conductivity from the baseline, that could indicate like more stormwater influence, for instance. Um, some of the different things that run off the road might give you a, an increased conductivity reading. Now, Anna, do you want to con comment on conductivity at all? Uh, sure. Um, conductivity is measuring the ability of water to conduct electricity. Water by itself doesn't conduct, pure water doesn't conduct electricity very well, despite all those videos they showed of people throwing uh, toasters into bathtubs to kill people. That's do that doesn't really work too well. But if you, uh, if you add salt to the water, or if you like put metal filings in the water, fine metal, metal particles, that would increase the ability of the water to, um, to conduct electricity. I have found that, um, spring water can be a higher conductivity. Um, so, so it can be, so water can be naturally high with like lots of minerals in it. Um, so water that's coming out of the ground has lots of minerals and so that, that can cause the conductivity to be, to be high. But in normal situations, our conductivity should be relatively low. Our waters, if, if our water is clean, then, um, you know, we should be seeing pretty low conductivity. I have seen a scale that says that fish basically start to just not be happy once they're getting to like levels of uh, 500 micro seams, uh, siemens or higher. Um, but in general, I just, uh, I view it as just a, um, if there's, if the conductivity is super high, there's, there's a bunch of stuff in the water. That stuff might be naturally there, but it could also be a pollutant. Can I can I add something too? Like everything that, that you all said is correct. And it's the you know very much tied because it's about the ions that are in the solution, the the dissolved ions in the water. Um, 
it's very much tied to groundwater and geology. So locally here in our area, the, the conductivities that result from our geologies really are, are within a certain sort of narrow range from I'm gonna say roughly a hundred micro siemens per centimeter up to 300 to 400 micro siemens per centimeter. So now, now keep in mind, that's, that's like sort of the geologic signal you would get from groundwater. So that's more what you're gonna see in the summer, like in say, let's say Bear Creek in the summer, it's mostly groundwater that's in that creek. And so you're gonna be seeing, and I'm gonna say Bear Creek is between about 100 and 200 for that particular smaller you know, sub, sub area within King County. Um, you know, surface runoff generally is lower in conductivity because it hasn't come into contact with the ground or like the sort of geologic layers, the soil. So also like snow melt. So actually, you know, a lot of our water in drinking, our drinking water comes from these rivers that there's a lot of snow melt, that water has very low conductivity. So our drinking water usually has conductivity around 70 or 80, which is below like, again, sort of like normal groundwater in the region. Thanks, Cameron. Okay. Um, any so, other? Eric, is there any way to record this on the uh, website or not? We're just recording it on our paper. No, Sorry about that. Uh, three one. <laughs> Sounds like Dave's playing ping pong uh, or something. Uh, yes, there is actually on the um, on the assuming that you're capturing your data on the Global Water Watch database, there is a section that you can check for other chemical tests, and then there's a specific section where you can put in conductivity. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on that? Okay, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about. Uh, our cards. So our cards. Sorry, I'm getting rid of these controls again. So our cards are. Uh, well, we've switched to doing our cards for our bacteria monitoring, and there's a variety of different our cards that you can get. Um, so, for instance, uh, Thornton Creek. Alliance is using the card that just strictly has E. coli, and that makes it simplest uh, because all you see is you see blue dots if you have E. coli, and you don't see anything if you don't have that. Um, Surge at Global Water Watch is recommending the ECCA card for now, just because um, for uh, if you don't see let's say that you had no E. coli and you have the E. coli card, you would just get a blank. And so the question would be maybe, did you do something? Did you actually collect a sample or did you do something that somehow killed off all the bacteria or uh, what have you? So for right now, we're providing the ECCA card. So E. coli will show up as pink. So that's an example of a card that I used just uh, like a week ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, showing the E. coli is the blue and then the other coliform bacteria is the pink. So that's what we're using for now, but this is a ongoing process. If we discover that that makes it more difficult or for whatever reason we may switch in the future, right now we're using the ECCA card. And then the process, we've kind of talked about this before, but you basically have two options. You can either pipette it and place the sample on the card directly at the stream or you can collect the sample in a sterile container and place it on the card later. So if the location that you have on the stream is not good for doing the putting it on the card, you can collect it and take it back somewhere else. Um, and then we have 
cards, pipettes, and bottles. So if you want bottles, we can give you bottles if you're going to do that, collecting it and plating it elsewhere. And then the process, basically collect a sample. One or two ml sample is what I recommend on these three ml cards. You can use three mls, but um, it has a tendency to run off the card. I know Cameron has talked with us about this before, and they recommend using the maximum size so that you're the most likely to capture colonies. But just from a logistical standpoint, um, I think it's easier for our program to use a, a smaller sample size. Um, you'll let it gel for one or two minutes on a flat surface, and then you transport it back for incubation. And when you incubate it, you're going to incubate it at you know, 35 Celsius plus or minus 0.5 for 15 to 24 hours. And you can incubate it higher if you're only detecting E. coli. In terms of determining the results, you just count the blue dots. Those are E. coli, pink if you're doing other coliform. And then what I've found is that sometimes right when you pull it out of the incubator, um, they're not as easy to read as after you let them sit for a few hours, the color seems to become more apparent. So a little bit of additional time may make it easier to, to count the dots. So anybody have any questions on E. coli? I don't know, Eric, um, thank you for the word about um, letting it sit a little bit longer. That, that would be um, after you've taken it out of the incubator, right? Yeah. Okay, because you know mine um, are consistently really um, really light, and but I I take them out and count them um, right away, and I the, I leave them in um, twenty four hours, maybe a little bit longer. So I'm, but if 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 they would, yeah, next time I think I'll do like mm -hmm. you do, set them out for a while. Um, you said a couple hours or something, even, and they get darker. Even the next day, really, but yeah. I'll, I'll let Gary and Anna. Yeah. yeah, so basically, yeah, a couple of things. So with Thornton Creek, um, we have um, E. coli pretty much throughout the system. Um, so, and we use a three mil sample uh, on our cards. <clears throat> and actually, uh, we don't get any um, spillover if you can use a technique where you pretty much dot the water drops and small drops across the card back and forth. So you're not puddling in any one particular location and you keep the card level. What we, what we can do, and it's because we have the New Zealand mud snails in the creek, we don't go into the creek to do the sampling. We have a scoop that we use to get the sample. So what we do is, is actually bring the scoop back to the vehicle or to where our, we're going to take the sample. And we have the cards kind of uh, on a flat surface. And we can then um, use the pipette to put it on the card. And after, uh, you know, leave it for about 30 seconds to a minute. And then you can move the card around um, and place it in another position. But um, the three mil card is for us is important because it does give you a bigger sample size. So you're going to get a little um, more representative result. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of how we're doing it. And, and it's not, occasionally we'll get zero, but I, we do duplicate sampling, not triplicate. And it's pretty unusual for us to get two zeros. So we'll usually see a zero in a one or something like that. And there's usually, you know, reasonably good agreement between samples, but again, the higher you go, the further apart some of your results are going to be. Um, so people kind of have gotten used to, you know, uh, maybe one card having six or seven and another card having 12, and then we do the average on that. But anyway, that's that's kind of what we're doing in Thornton Creek. Sure, Anna, how about you? Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask Gary a question. Um, we're using the uh, one mil cards right now, I'm basically waiting to run out of them so that when I order next, I'll get the three mil size cards. But uh, are you doing a duplicate on every sample you take? Yeah, because we're just doing that. We're doing a, a duplicate one, one every session. 
Yeah, we do. So basically, we go down to the creek, scoop a sample up, bring it back, and do duplicates on each each sample. Okay. So yeah, that's the way we're doing it. And um, are you averaging or? Yeah, you know? yeah. Then we average the result out and have a single result. Um, and then let's see. What did you, you started out with? Something about that I lost. I was, I was asking about the one. I I didn't really have a. That was oh, the three mil. Yeah, so the, the three mil um, is kind of a special order scenario. So yeah, I, last time we, the last several times you ordered it, uh, you know, it's not on their order sequence, uh, you know, to fill out. So you really have to ask for it specially, but um, that shouldn't be a problem. All right, any other uh, comments on that? Or questions? Eric, I'll just add that um, we at King County, yeah, we've we switched over to our cards basically completely from the Kali scan. We're using the ECC three milliliter. And uh, we use actually, we do not use three mils. We use like two or 2.5. And, you know, even the 2.5, sometimes a little bit of water will, will get off. And, you know, we're often doing like 30 samples in a day. And so, we, we don't, we, we need to just be able to dump the water on the card, you know, carefully, but even being carefully, uh, being careful. So yeah, two or 2.5, we've done about 90 side-by-sides now where we've um, submitted a sample to our environmental lab and they've done the, uh, you know, standard membrane fil filtration method. And um, over those 90 samples, of course, most of the results are gonna be on the low end. Um, but overall, uh, the ECC was was better than the one mil, the three milliliter card. We were actually using two milliliters for our side by, side by sides, and that was uh, better. It performed better, more more like the lab results, the official lab results, than either the one milliliter card or the Kali scan. Um, once you get down to like you know below 100, you know CFU or 200 CFU per hundred mils, like mm, maybe the Kali scan is, is just as good. Anyways, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd add that. We could share those data too, if they're ever useful to anyone. Sure, I'd be interested in getting a copy of that. Yeah, we did We did a crossover, you know, initially between um, the easy gel and this, and we actually had a very good, we had correlations of 0.95. Um, between the two techniques before we made the switch over. So it is good. And it does take, you know, the three mil um, takes, yeah, you gotta take some time to, to get that down. But um, I think of the five teams, six teams that we have, uh, nobody, maybe one person is getting some spillage on the odd occasion but they're really able to do it. You know, it's, it's, um, it's doable with three mils. And uh, so, yeah, again, if somebody has some questions about how we do it, I'm happy to, to, to tell, to show you, we can do a little video for you. Sure. Anna? Sorry, I'm, I just have to go, um, but Good. I wanted to, I put something in the chat and I was wondering who here was from uh, Seahurst Park from that area. Is there someone here from the Seahurst? Uh, Kelly with uh, Friends of Saltwater State Park is down in that oh. vicinity, but uh, not exactly there. Okay. Uh, well, I'm just, I just, anybody that's in that area, I just would have them check out the chat and I've got to go. So thank you, everybody. Okay. I'll, thanks. I'll watch the video at the end. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. So Eric, my my only last question, if I can, on the on the e cards, is uh, my understanding is any detectable E. coli, if you're doing a one mil sample, is a, a bad indication. Am, am, am I wrong on that? What no, I mean, that's correct. That is correct. Yeah, because it you know the minimum standard now the the standard is you don't want to find uh, over one hundred CFU. Um, per liter for, for uh you know in 100 uh, milliliters so you know if you find one, one or more 
uh, colonies, yep. then you're finding that you have a water quality problem. Yep. Okay, good. Interestingly, well, let me, I think I got a couple, I'm going to move, actually, does anybody else have any more questions on this right now? Okay. Uh, I'm going to share screen and I think I've got a couple last things to go over here. Um, okay. So uh, that was pretty much it. This is a picture of uh, Brian and I did some uh, macro invertebrate work with a uh, fourth grade class at uh, Our Lady of Lake School. They do an annual uh, macro invertebrate assessment of uh, Maple Creek, which is a tributary of Thorn Creek. And of course, thanking all of you, all of our partners, um, King County Council Member Rod Dembowski, who was at the Green Globe Award and basically told us that we're going to get continued funding for our program um, and some of our other partners. So I'm going to stop the share right now. And uh, this would be a good time for, uh, since we're on the topic of bacteria, Gary and I recently got <clears throat> some results back on the DNA sampling project. So Gary, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, if you could make me uh, co-host, I'll share some of the data that we got back, okay? Okay, you should be able to share the screen. Okay, Let's see if I can bring this up here. I know where we are here. Okay, and let me go. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So yeah, so this is the partnership that uh, Eric mentioned between Snow King Watershed Council and Thornton Creek Alliance. And we got um, grant money from King County to do this kind of research into whether this might be a practical way to kind of determine the sources of the uh, E. coli in the uh, in the creeks and, and rivers in our uh, region. So um, this is kind of how we've moved through. Initially, we worked with King County uh, Environmental Labs uh, initially to try to compare filtration techniques because this particular procedure that we're uh, supplying samples for uh, the DNA analysis is requiring a uh, Cerevex filter off of the end of a syringe. And that's a different type of way of collecting samples from what's the traditional way that the uh, King County, for example, Environmental Labs does their filtration. So we did, we wanted to do that initially, which we did with the number of samples. And that was in the first run that we made with, um, again, Veriset, which is the company that's doing uh, this DNA um, analysis for us. Uh, we also developed our procedures for handling and chipping these filters, which again are um, sensitive to temperature and needed to be handled in a very special way to make sure that they were not um, uh, damaged in terms of uh, transit. Uh, we've submitted two sets of filters for analysis, uh, one uh, earlier last year, uh, and then the second set we sent out uh, at the beginning of October and didn't actually get any results until just this last week, which was a little bit of a concern for us, why it was taking so long. And currently, you know, we're, con we're continuing to kind of evaluate the results and see if, you know, we can, you know, make heads or tails out of what the information is that we're getting. So this, uh, this I, I think I shared this with the, with the group um, uh, several months ago were the results that we got back first on that first sampling. And again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but the red uh, results are what are considered to be significant enough that um, we can see that there's a strong signal and this animal is likely to be a source of some of the contamination of, uh, in the creek. So for example, up here, we have this site eight, 
Um, we got a signal of 0.34. And again, if it's in this source tracker value, if it was greater than 0.2, then it had a high probability of being from that. And we talked about this. So we saw three samples that were kind of in red for human. And um, then we had this ruminant, which you know could be cows or something. And that was very puzzling about where the heck that came from. We didn't quite understand that, but that we did get a lot of signals from that also in that first series of samples. So um, one thing I did, again, you kind of get data, so you might as well see if you can figure out if anything correlates with anything else. So I, I actually took a look at the first um, information and I used kind of both the human um, for the highly probable and then this kind of middle of the ground, do some more work kind of correlation. And I plotted that kind of versus what our E. coli results were. And um, it actually kind of almost resembles, you know, a straight line kind of relationship. So that was kind of interesting. Again, a one shot deal, but did, I did see some kind of a correlation that was going on there. Hey, Gary. Yep. Yeah. I think I saw that um, Cameron had a question. Oh, sure. Cam oh, I'm sorry. I was like, I guess I could have waited. But what was the name of the lab where you who analyzed oh, the filters? Oh, oh, so Veriset is a lab. It's a kind of a spinoff of the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. A professor uh, at Lawrence Livermore who's been doing DNA analysis on water over many years um, came up with uh, you know a system and what they call a phylochip that um, allows him to look at various species of DNA and then using this source tracker, kind of based on the signals that he's seeing, you know, brings this data together and says, oh, this looks like it came, if I did a, you know, a pure sample of say from a human or a horse or a pig or something, it has the same pattern. So that's how he um, kind of developed his technique and then, um, uh, but that's, yeah, that's uh, Veracet, V-R-A-C-E-T is the, is the name of the company that he formed. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so then here's the second results. The second results came through. Eric and I kind of took a look at it, scratched our heads, <laughs> I figure out what's going on here. Um, so this, this was interesting. We did supply, after the last time around, we said, hey, you know, um, can you tell if there's any beaver in this? And uh, Gary, uh, the uh, Gary Anderson, who's who's the uh, professor there, said, "Well, we didn't have any samples of, of beaver scat, so we sent him some." So anyway, so uh, in the so th we did come up with one. Actually, it was one of your guys' samples, um, 187th and what 70? I can't remember 76th or something like that. But the point is that you did get a, a hit, fairly significant signal of all the signals. And in fact, in the yellow region, which again, there's some definition down here about indicated, you know, there's a probability, but it's not anything significant. And they'd say more testing is necessary, but um, you can see that we got really a high signal right here. I don't know there's beavers in that creek. And then um, we got some signals that were in yellow here. Uh, we also got a signal for birds um, out of one of our sites. And over here, we got a couple of signals for raccoons. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but um, the real question was, no, he, we, other than this very small signal here on humans, uh, this location, we really got no human um, signals out of this particular set of samples. And we had some extremely high E. coli results. For example, over here at site 19, we had 10,000 um, E. coli, which is like, you know, crazy. And yet, you know, we did get a signal for raccoon, but we saw nothing, nothing on the, really on the human side at all. So, um, so where, where does that take us? Oop. All right, so that second set of samples was different than the first set. And you may have noticed in the numbers that in the first set, they kind of had two significant figures on the, on the right side of the decimal. 
So they were reporting 0 0.03, 0 0.04. This last set, they were pointing, if I go back to it, let's see if I can, they were giving four significant numbers here. And in many cases, in, in down like 0 0.03, where before you needed to have a 0.2 to be significant. So it's a different procedure. And the reason that they had to do a different procedure is because um, they said that they didn't get a lot of DNA from our sample. So basically they couldn't draw conclusions about what was going on. So there's a, a few other factors going on here as well. First of all, we sent the samples to them in October, beginning of October. Somebody was, one of their folks was on uh, maternity leave and they didn't actually get the DNA for, a, I mean, at least a month or more from the time that we sent them the samples. So it was a month to two months before we got a DNA result. Then once they got their DNA result, um, it was a considerable length of time before they did the first analysis on this, which was the traditional one, I'm calling it traditional, which was the one that basically they did on the first round. But when they did that, they couldn't get any, any results. Um, again, because they didn't feel like they got enough DNA. So they went through and did an alternate procedure and where they were actually kind of amplified the signal and also put in um, uh, some samples of known samples in to compare with what they were getting. So for example, if they had a sample from a horse, they, they put that in along with this sample and they kind of did a comparison to take a look at whether they've got something significant or not compared to the original. So it was a really different procedure. So we kind of have results coming from two different directions here. And then the third one, as I mentioned, is the source signal, uh, source tracker number. The significance is, has changed and it's a little bit hard to really kind of understand what's going on with that. So the results are not very definitive in this case. The ones that are high, we can believe probably are significant, like the raccoons is a very possible one. And, um, and the uh, beaver is, is potentially possible, excuse me. So um, here's kind of what we're learning. E. coli is only a small portion of what is being used in the DNA analysis. So here's, this is the, you know, everybody thinks about E. coli and says, hey, this is going to tell us exactly what's going on. But in the practical world of DNA, um, the E. coli bacteria is really just a small part of the total DNA of the animal that can get into the water system. So in this technique, they're looking at kind of a whole bunch of things, and the E. coli is just a small portion of that. So it's, it's kind of, you know, we can get a high E. coli number, but not necessarily see it as a, in, in the uh, analysis based on say a human or something like that. Um, so that's something that we have to kind of get a better understanding of as we're going through this. A high E. coli does not necessarily mean an animal source. So this was something that when we talked with uh, our, our uh, contact, Gary Anderson, um, he basically said, hey, you know, E. coli doesn't need to come from an animal. It can come from, um, you know, just being at the bottom of the creek and be scoured up in a, in a rainstorm, or it could come from a wash off from something that was growing E. coli in the ground. So that again, you know, kind of let, led us to say, well, wait a second, you know, we're using that to close beaches, <laughs> to, to talk about health and safety. And, you know, so there's some other things going on here that are kind of different. Now, I'm, I'm still a firm believer that we have to take a, a conservative approach here. So if we're seeing E. coli, that means that we don't want to take any chances on people's health. And we should be, you know, doing these kinds of things. But it does, in terms of analysis, does create some additional questions. Okay, the question about how much DNA was collected. 
So in the first result, we collected it on the filters the way we did for the second result. But for some reason, the amount of DNA that they got in the end, and it may be a result of the time involved in something else that was going on, they didn't get as much. So um, it's not clear you know, why we got less, but we're going to try to do something a little bit different coming up. And I'm going to talk about that in a second here. So we decided that we'll do a filtration series to maximize the amount of material that we've collected. So instead of just doing 100 mils, which is what we originally did, we're going to maximize out and see how much we can actually put through a filter um, before it starts to plug, before it's almost impossible to push through with, uh, with the uh, syringe. And we'll do a couple of two or three different levels and see what happens at different locations and not really worry about what the E. coli result is, but really just try to capture a lot of material for the DNA analysis. And we're gonna submit it to a separate laboratory that, um, that actually Veriset is going to pay for, which is nice. They're going to actually um, pay for this DNA analysis so that um, uh, we all get a better understanding of kind of what's going on. Um, and the amount of DNA collected and in information, we're going to use it to determine how we're going to do the next series of samples. Um, and the thought is that we will be collecting roughly 15 samples sometime after we've kind of gone through our DNA analysis. We're going to collect them and um, at what we consider to be critical spots. And again, not necessarily looking at the, well, we're going to do the E. coli analysis, but we're not going to use that as our criteria for submitting samples as we've done before. And, um, and then we're going to turn those in and see what kind of output we get in terms of animal um, uh, signals from those particular samples. So hopefully, I hope I didn't confuse you too much. <laughs> I'm confused enough already. Um, but this is a research project. Uh, we got money to support it based on that. And so uh, research, you know, kind of takes you in lots of different directions and we'll see where we go. So that's... That's it, and I'll try to answer any questions, and the ones I can't, I'm going to send over to Eric. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. All right, there you go. Okay, I think I saw that Cameron has his hand up for a question. Cameron, did you have a question? Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I don't want to hog it up too much here. Um, but is is it true to say that what you're testing here is um, it's maybe telling you more about the the just what animals are present? Hopefully, okay. Like I guess ideally, this would tell you what animals are present in the drainage basin, but it doesn't necessarily tell you which animals are responsible for the fecal pollution in the drainage basin because you know the dna the dna of an animal can be in its hair and its skin flakes anything it doesn't mean that its poop actually got into the stream is is that correct to say or am i misunderstanding well, the analysis that is, you're doing here yeah so it is correct to say that um in some regard uh but i'm still trying to figure out exactly you know his argument about e coli can be high and not be suggestive of fecal coliform or fecal uh, material in the creek that's kind of where he's coming from that it doesn't necessarily mean that so um so i tend to agree with what you're saying but this you know there's kind of another slant to this that I have to try to, you know, think think my way through. Remember when I did the, I showed you that little correlation earlier about human versus, you know, the first results. Uh -huh. and, and so, you know, so I think that it will show some of that, but it's does it's not an automatic to me based on what I'm seeing from the second results. I'm hoping that we can go back to the first way of doing it because I think that's a little more promising. And I think, and he feels the same way. The second second procedure just to get results 
was um, far more involved and, um, and obviously has more questions in my mind. Um, the fund that uh, I think our hope originally in putting this project together was that we might find, you know, if we found high bacteria, we wanted to know was that bacteria, that E. coli, something that was contributed by humans, you know, something that we might be able to do something about, like, you know, help get some behavior changes or some water treatment or something to hopefully reduce the bacteria in the stream. And I think what we're finding is it's not uh, two things. On our second set of samples, we didn't really see a lot of human signal in the data. And also um, even high E. coli may not necessarily correlate to high signal of one type or another. So at this point, we're, we're, we're learning something, but we're not necessarily learning that, that the bacteria that we find is going to be something that we can really do anything about. Yeah, I think, again, the fact that all the human results were tended to be on the lower side. Um, again, the, our researcher basically said he can't draw a conclusion on the low things being actually low. So it doesn't mean that we didn't have human. It just means that in the with the amount of DNA that we had in that sample that they can't couldn't really make that determination. Well, um, I, I'd be happy to, this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and we, you know, we work with King County Environmental Lab really closely and we haven't used Vericep, but we've used Source Molecular in Florida and actually had right. yep. very, dis very disappointing results. And we're a little cynical about it now, about the state of the science, but without gumming up this meeting, um, yeah, all the questions that you're bringing up, Eric, and you, Gary. Um, yeah, we have, those are those are all interesting questions that I thought about, and maybe some other time when, yeah, love to talk about it. Yeah, no, I mean that's good, and and it it might be worthwhile um, if you're interested to get involved with the conversation with uh, Gary Anderson. You know, Eric and I love to have other folks. <laughs> come in and listen to what we're talking about and especially those that are in more in the field than I am for sure. So yeah, that, if you're interested in doing something like that, he's very open to, you know, being involved in this process. Yeah, I think that ultimately there that his hope with that company Veriset is that they can create a process that is useful to say government agencies to analyze what's going on in their watershed. So yeah. we'd be happy to loop you into the conversation. So I've got a couple more questions. Brian has a question. And then after Brian, I see Debbie has a question. So I, I just need a clarification because I, I think this goes back to Cameron's question, which is what, what DNA are they sampling? I, my under, initial understanding was that they were sampling the different DNA of the different E. coli in the water. No, is that not the, if this is just any DNA sample they find? Yeah, it, it's right. Bacteria. Yeah, it's bacterial DNA. Yeah, bacterial DNA coming from all kinds of different sources. But okay, so what? So it can't just be DNA from a skin, then? No, it's not. No, right. It has to be skin. It has to be actual bacteria DNA. It's, it's it's from their gastrointestinal their their gut right it's from their right. gut right yeah yeah right okay okay that's okay. my that's our understanding of okay it. so that that that's a lot that's a lot different from what yeah so if yeah it's no it isn't coli, yeah it's not yeah it's not the skin or the or something flaking off from the animal yeah. or something it's yeah okay they they did feces samples from all of the you know horse a pig a da 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 and that's where they get their kind of their library that they do their comparisons against. Debbie, you had a question. You're on mute, maybe. Yeah, um, and I don't know why my my video refused to go off, but anyway, I was curious, and without the chart in front of me. I, I may be off base here, but I was curious about salmon because 
one of the, I thought it was around October were some of the sampling. And when I Googled, you know, is, can, is there E. coli from rotting salmon? There's lots of rotting salmon in our streams. Could that be any of, any of the E. coli? And I mean, it's not really, when salmon are degrading, it's not salmon poop, but it does say that there's bacteria that come from rotting salmon. So is that maybe something we've overlooked or? Well, it's, I, I, I assume it's it's a possibility. Um, you know, we haven't talked about it with him in terms of uh, you know that kind of a sample, or whether they've run something like that from, uh, from fish, it, basically. It, but it, it, it's it's not it's not possible that it's, it's E. coli from from salmon because oh yeah, no, that's e, these are animals. They're, yeah. they're warm blooded. Yes, warm blooded. Yeah, right. Exactly. Now that's no. but again. It, it, they might be able to pick something up. Who knows? But the point is that um, that the uh, there's a there is a what they call an unknown area to this, where they actually collect signals that they can't um, determine what it's from, and they'll put it into what they call their unknown category. So they do kind of track that as well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I thought unlikely, but I just saw the time yeah. of year and thought, well, so yeah. maybe. Okay, right. thanks. Yeah. yeah, the mammal issue is uh, you know, pretty close. Birds are obviously part of that too. Okay. Thanks, Gary. No. All right, does anybody else have any other uh, questions or anything kind of for the good of the order that they wanted to, to bring up? Okay, well, uh, in that case, then thank you for joining us on this meeting and hopefully I'll stay in touch with you guys and see some of you guys at some of our upcoming training and other events. So thanks very much. And okay. thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Congratulations thanks, again. Sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Eric, do you have any idea where uh, my thing will not uh, un for the video? It keeps saying that it can't start video for mine. Not that anybody needed to see my face, but what is it? What is it doing? It says stop. Every time I click on start video, it says unable to. Um, it says you know, unable to start video for me. And did I you, thought, okay. did you did you turn off your recording of the meeting?